Hello, everybody. It's nice to see so many of you here today and to see you in person. Um, as Deborah just said, my name is Nicola Robinson. I am a respiratory doctor. Um, and I am still in my training. I was sat in your shoes about 16 years ago and I am still going. Medicine is a fantastic career and the fact that you are sat here and considering this is a wonderful, wonderful thing. Um, we need huge numbers of enthusiastic, young, intelligent, bright people to join our profession. We're delighted you're here today with us. And we've, as we've said, we've got a huge, um, I've got a big panel of speakers today to talk you through some things. Again, what we'll do is we'll go through the talks first of all, and then we'll save all the questions for the end and we'll answer them as a panel. So um, feel free to type them into Slido in case you're thinking of something and you can't quite remember it. And we'll kind of pull together some themes to talk about them as well. And for those in the room, please come and speak to us afterwards if you've got any questions at all. Um, we are, you know, given the last few years, we are absolutely delighted, um, as I say, to have so many of you here. And um, first of all, I'm going to invite uh, our first set of speakers to talk about becoming a doctor. And the first pro part of that process is the admissions process. Um, so I'm going to invite Debbie Clark and Amanda Smart, who are joining us from the University of Edinburgh, um, to talk about the admissions there. Um, but they'll give you a general overview of how to, um, of how to get into medical school. Hi everyone, it's good to see so many of you here with us this afternoon. So unfortunately you have myself and Amanda with you today. You should have had Professor Lorna Marson, who is a kidney transplant surgeon most of the time, um, but she's also our Dean of Admissions, but unfortunately she's been called away to do a, a kidney transplant this afternoon. So we have stepped in um, just to give you all of this information that you'll need if you want to apply for medicine at the University of Edinburgh, which is where we're from. So we're just going to take you through a summary of the admissions process, first of all. So we thought we would start with the standard academic entry requirements, which you've probably already looked up about a thousand times, but we'll just talk you through them uh, generally. So in terms of, if you're doing SQA qualifications, you need National 5 English, Maths, Biology and Chemistry, preferably all at Grade B. If you don't meet that Grade B at Nat 5, but you're doing that subject at higher, you can kind of trump that grade at higher. So say, you know, you slipped up and you got a C, maybe for English, but you were doing higher English. As long as you meet our grade requirements at higher, we just kind of ignore that Grade C in English at Nat 5. You need five SQA hires by the end of S5 at grades uh, AAAAB and you must have chemistry and two other sciences so you can choose from either biology, maths or physics. So biology, it can be either biology or human biology. If it's maths, it can either be straightforward mathematics or it can be application of maths at higher. We accept that too as one of the other sciences. And then in S6, we go on to ask for two advanced higher hires, both at grade B and we don't have a preference for subjects at all. If you're doing A-levels, anybody here doing A-levels today? No? Yeah, one at the back, yep. Okay, so we look for GCSE, same subjects as Nat 5, so it's English, Maths, Biology and Chemistry, all at a grade B or a 6. And then you need your three A-levels and one set of exams, um, and they have to be at grades A, A, A. And again, you must have chemistry. And then you can choose from either biology, maths, or physics. So biology, again, can either be biology or human biology. Maths can either be maths or further maths. But we wouldn't accept both. So you couldn't do chemistry, biology, and human biology, and you, or you couldn't do chemistry, maths, and further maths. We only accept one of the maths and one of the biologies. Anyone doing the international baccalaureate here today? No, no hands that I can see. Oh yeah, there's one there, okay. So for the IB, we're looking for 37 points overall, and that includes your um, theory of knowledge and your extended essay. And then you need six, six, seven at higher level, and again, it's the same subject requirements. You have to have chemistry, and then one from biology, maths, or physics. Biology must be taken to at least standard level, if it's not one of your higher level subjects, and we look for standard level English and maths, both at a grade five. And from um, maths, we accept analysis and approaches and applications and interpretations, so either of those maths. 
Um, I don't th I do we don't have any graduates in the room, I don't think. Are we all school at school here? No graduates? We'll not go we'll not go through the graduate requirements. So I wanted to talk to you just a wee bit about um, Flag Plus. So Flag Plus is part of our widening participation um, programme. So I'll talk a wee bit more about the criteria for that in a minute. But if you qualify for a plus flag with the University of Edinburgh, the requirements are slightly different. So you'll see that they drop slightly. For Nat 5, it's just the same. But at higher, it's three A's and two B's. Subject requirements are the same. Advanced higher, two C's. And then it's the same if you're doing A levels or the IB. That requirement just drops slightly for you. So flag applicants, so flag and flag plus applicants, both these sets of applicants, it's part of our widening participation policy. So um, you can click on our web pages later on once this is finished. And if you, you just Google in Edinburgh University's website, widening participation or widening participation offers, widening access offers, it'll explain what the criteria is for both. And there's actually a really useful data checker so you can enter your details into that data checker and it will tell you if at the University of Edinburgh we would consider you a flag applicant or a flag plus applicant and it's based on a lot of things it's based on things like where you live what school you go to if you have any care experience if you're a refugee or asylum seeker so it's, it's based on a lot of things so it's always good to go in and check that and then you know which entry, entry requirements you have to meet so as a flag applicant, you have to meet the standard entry requirements, but as a flag plus applicant, you only have to meet our minimum entry requirements. And if you're a flag applicant, you get additional consideration in terms of we give you additional academic points just to boost your application a little. If you're a flag plus applicant, you get a lot of additional consideration. So you will get um, additional points in terms of your academics, You'll get additional consideration in terms of your UCAT score, so you get a 10% uplift in your total UCAT score, and you're also guaranteed an invitation to one of our assessment days. And when we talk about assessment days, it's just another word for interview. We just like to call them assessment days because we're assessing lots of, of different um, things on that particular day. So, um, currently we offer extra support for non-graduate applicants, and this is just part of the criteria who are care experienced, um, reside in specific geographical areas within um, the UK, um, particularly Scotland, but in other areas of the UK as well. If you attend a low progression to higher education school, um, if you've got significant caring responsibilities, so if you care for a member of your family, we want to know about that. So you don't have to squeeze it into your personal statement. You could get your academic referee, your teacher, to tell us a bit more about what your daily or weekly caring responsibilities are, because we'll certainly look at that as well. But we can only look at it if we know about it. So you need to tell us, or you can email us in with all that additional information. It doesn't have to go in your personal statement. If you're a refugee or asylum seeker, as I said before, or if you've participated in one of our recognised access programmes as well. But if you're, a, we'll not talk about graduate applicants because there's none here today. So those are the links. Um, I don't know if you'll be getting copies of these slides at the end, but we can give you copies of these slides at the end so you can follow those links and lead, read a wee bit more about that. So I'm going to hand you over to Amanda now so that you're not bored listening to me prattling on. Um, I'm going to let Amanda tell you a wee bit more about UCAT and how we use it at Edinburgh. Hi everyone, so yeah, I'm Amanda um, and as Debbie just said, I'll just begin, I'll talk to you about a few of the different components we'll look at when we assess an application. But first of all, um, yeah, we'll talk about the UCAT. So, as well as the academics, which Debbie kind of went into a little bit of detail about, UCAT is another of our entry requirements that we look at in the assessment process. So this is an essential part of the application um, and you must take the test just prior to applying. So say for example you're applying this September for next year's entry, you would have to set the UCAT test during this summer, so between July and September, just prior to applying. 
Um, the booking and test dates and also the available test centres, they're published on the UCAT website. Um, and also, um, we have a UCAT webpage on our Edinburgh Uni webpages as well. So um, that all that information is there for you. Um, what we'll say, first of all, we get a lot of questions about the best way to revise for the UCAT. The UCAT website is, is amazing. It has lots of great resources. There's practice tests available on there. Um, so we would say that that's the best thing to do. We can't really revise as such. It's more just the practice tests and resources on the website. Um, also, we'll ask you, don't send your results to us because we'll receive them directly from UCAT. Um, but uh, if we don't receive your scores, we'll get in touch with you. So that's just like kind of housekeeping there. But I'll go into a bit more detail about how we use the UCAT in Edinburgh. So this is new for 2023 entry. We now have a minimum UCAT cutoff score. Um, so that will be 2,470, as you'll see there. Um, so that's just new. But the, the cutoff score, it may vary. That, that may not be set in stone for future cycles. We would always advise you to check the web pages before you apply. Um, but for 2023 entry, that's the minimum cutoff there. Um, in order to be considered. So um, once all the scores are received, we rank them and divide them in the, the cohort scores into deciles or 10 equal groups. And then we allocate a score for each group. Um, we also allocate a score to the situational judgment test banding. So that's another part of the UCAT test where you must obtain a band three, two or one. If you band, uh, obtain a band four in the SJT, we can't proceed with your application. Um, but the minimum UCAT score, that um, applies to all applicants apart from our plus flag applicants, which Debbie was kind of telling you a bit more about. Um, so if you are eligible to apply as a plus flag applicant, the minimum cutoff score doesn't apply to you, but all applicants must obtain at least a band three in the SJT, which is part of the UCAT, to be considered. Um, yeah, so that's probably like most of what I want to say about the UCAT test. Um, obviously, if you have any questions about it, we can go into a bit more detail later on. Um, the next part of our... Oh, I think I've clicked the wrong button. No, there we go. Um, so I'll also go on to talk to you um, a bit about our non-academic side of the application as well. So mainly the personal statement and what we, we kind of look for in, within that. Um, so just before I kind of get into detail about this, this is just specific to Edinburgh Medical School within the University of Edinburgh. Um, we don't formally assess the personal statement in the assessment process, but we'd, again, we would always recommend getting in touch with other institutions if you're applying elsewhere. This is for Edinburgh Medical School. We don't formally assess it, but it, is, it provides you with an opportunity to tell, you, tell us about yourself and it also... Um, forms essential preparation if you are shortlisted to our assessment days or interviews. Um, so obviously it's important for that, so you have more experience to draw upon, um, more to, to talk about, etc. But we don't formally score it. So basically, as you'll see here, we kind of look for three main components within the personal statement. So the first, your personal qualities and skills. So examples include empathy, um, your interpersonal skills, your communication skills, um, your ability to communicate, um, which is obviously important for being a doctor. Um, what we'll say is we don't recommend, uh, as, as much as it's amazing to read about all the amazing skills you possess and all the, the, the amazing experiences that back it up, we don't recommend a long list. Basically what we'll say is focus on you know, a few key skills and a few key experiences that you've undertaken to reflect on this and rationalise how that would make you a good doctor. Um, so, for example, how can you evidence your team working skills? What, what experience have you undertaken to show that? That's kind of what we're looking for, like reflection, not so much just like a list of many, you know, we value the quality over quantity of experiences, basically. Um, so that's like your personal qualities and skills. We'll also look at evidence of career exploration. So again, um, you know, any work experience that you've maybe undertaken. Um, any, so for example, shadowing health professionals or in health promotion, working in a nursing home, for example, um, volunteering with disabled people, so like any kind of voluntary work that you've done. Um, even just speaking with doctors and medical students and attending events like this today, this is all amazing things that you can mention within your personal statement. Um, 
Also, yes, open days, medical conferences and lectures, as I said. Um, also, we understand during COVID it's been tricky um, for you to get, you know, hands-on experience. So reading, watching and listening to medical-themed literature, we, we, we like to hear about that as well. Um, any digital, digital content or articles that you've, you've studied or read, read on. Um, and yeah, so again, we've got some links. Um, I think the, the, the bottom two links there, which you'll get if we, we send the slides around, it's quite, um, it's got quite good information in there about how to get valuable experience, to, like kind of from during COVID, if you can't get any hands-on experience. There's some good um, virtual um, experiences there that you can you can get. And then also the kind of third part we look at is your non-academic achievements and interests. So we do want to read about you, like how you balance your work and life, like your work and your personal and study life, how, how you balance that. Obviously, med medicine can be a demanding subject, so um, it's important to maintain a healthy study life balance. Um, so, for example, involvement in any community groups, um, extracurricular school responsibilities, so if you're a prefect or a captain, something like that. Um, any leadership leadership positions um, and any if you have like a part time job for example we like to, to read, read about that um, any cultural sporting vocational or voluntary achievements so one that we see quite often is the Duke of Edinburgh for example if you've you've undertaken that um, and then again just your general interests and hobbies we, we like to we like to read about it we like to get to try and get to know you as much as we can within the personal statement um, so yeah really it's a, a chance for you to tell us about yourself but just keep in mind that it's not for it's not formally assessed but it is important preparation if you are to be shortlisted to our interview all right so um i think just the final bit i'm going to speak about is um so how we assess your application basically um so the screening process um so basically as you'll see here um this is how we weight um, your each application so basically your academics, that's worth 25%. So the academic part is, for example, your national five higher and advanced hires. That's your, your predicted grades and your achieved grades. That counts for 25%. Then the UCAT score, which is by decile, as I mentioned, that counts for 17.5% of your application. And then the SJT, which is a situational judgment test, which is the, separate, the part of the UCAT, but we kind of weight it separately that's 7.5 percent so that makes up your first 50 percent of your application then um, we shortlist the, the approximate top score in 700 applicants to interview at assessment day and then the second 50 percent is your assessment day scores yeah so that's like how we assess each application that's the weightings there um, so basically our team check all the applications just to make sure first of all that the criteria has been met, all requirements have been met, and they are assessed and screened by two members of staff independently. Um, an important tip to remember is to, basically the, the portal that you will be on as part of my ed is called Euclid. This is, um, we'll be requests like further information from you, say for example if there's missing details in your application. Um, a top tip is just keep an eye on it, always keep an eye on that and your emails because there might be like essential information that we're asking for in order for us to assess your, your continue assessing your application. For example, if, um, if your personal statement hasn't been included or if we need a predicted grade or something like that. That's just a, a top tip as well. Um, and yes, yeah, so after the um, assessment days. Debbie will speak a bit later about kind of offer making periods but um, applicants are then ranked, offers will be made to the highest ranking candidates in each of the fee categories and then yeah and um, Debbie will talk a bit more about what happens kind of after that so I'll pass you on to Debbie she's actually going to speak to you just now a bit more about our assessment days or interviews. Thanks, Amanda. That's great. I'm really aware that we're throwing a lot of information at you just now. But hopefully, if you've got any questions, you can pop them on Slido and we'll answer them at the end. So our assessment days, our interviews, they would ordinarily take place over, over about half a day. They're about three, three and a half hours in length, which sounds horrific, but it's really not. Um, and it, for this year, we're going to adopt a hybrid approach. So during COVID, we had to um, do everything virtually, but we tried to keep it as true to the original setup of our assessment days as possible, and we managed that really well. So if you live within the UK, which I imagine all of you do, 
You will be asked to come in person. Anybody applying from out with the UK, we will probably still do it virtually because we're very aware of travel and sustainability um, at the University of Edinburgh. So, um, they're due to take place in December of this year and January into February of next year as well. The half-day session starts with a welcome talk, so it starts quite um, gently, if you like. So when you arrive, we take you into a room. There'll be, let me think, eight, eight of you? No, no. Six, twelve, twelve. There'll be twelve of you, I'm trying to remember. Um, there'll be twelve of you that arrive all together, so you'll all be together for the welcome talk. You'll come in and we'll just explain kind of what we're looking for at Edinburgh and our medical students. We'll explain all that to you before we start. We'll explain the kind of setup of the day as well, so you kind of know what to expect, so you're not then going blind into something. We'll explain all of that to you. So the session itself involves four stations. So there are three individual stations where it's just you um, with a selector. The selector will be asking you questions and you'll be answering questions and you'll rotate around those three stations. So we run sort of two sessions at the one time. So that's why there's 12 of you. So you get split into groups of six after that. In your group of six, the first three will go to the individual rotation stations and the other three will go into a group station and work together so you kind of have to forget that you're competing against people at that stage you just work together in that group as best you can um, but you're given instructions you're told what um, what it is that you need to do so yeah you're, you're fully briefed before you start and then obviously once you're finished the three rotation and the three group people are finished you swap over so you go into the group station with your little group of three and they go through to the individual stations. Um, I hope that doesn't sound too terrifying. Our selectors are lovely. They're all practicing, doctors, clinicians, um, and they just want the best out of you on that day. They're not scary. They're not trying to trip you up. They just want you to relax and be yourself and just be honest in your answers. Um, and during, um, in between times, because you get a little break in between each rotation station, um, one of our team will be there with you and we'll be chatting to you and just trying to keep you calm. We'll have water for you and a tissue uh, if you need a tissue. We'll have everything there for you and we just try and make it as nice an experience as possible. Obviously, you're being assessed, but we just try and make it as informal as we possibly can. What we're assessing for on these days is, is the most important attributes that we're seeking in our medical students, particularly at Edinburgh, and that's based on a consultation of clinicians and teachers from within the medical school itself. The attributes that we seek have already been selected from those published by the Medical Schools Council, and there's a wee link to that there, but you'll get that when you get the slides, and that will list all the attributes that the Medical Schools Council think are important in a medical student, and all we've done is we've picked our favourite ones, the ones that we think are most important, and we've based our assessment day on that. But we'd also suggest that you read the GMC document outcome for graduates as well, so that you know what's expected of you going forward. Um, so as I said, it's not a typical MMI format. You're typically placed in groups of six. The individual stations last for 12 minutes each, and you get a wee break of three minutes in between, just enough to just take a breath and have a glass of water and calm yourself down. And what we say to you is, if you think that station's gone badly, it's okay. You get a chance to start afresh with somebody who hasn't met you yet. So just try and take a breath and go in and start again. Um, the group exercise lasts for 45 minutes. So 35 minutes for applicants, to, for you all to work on the task. And then you come out and you get a bit of a 10 minute break before you move on to the individual rotations. And then, like I said, you swap over. So once all the assessment days are done, we just look at everybody and we look at your overall score. So I know that some medical schools will wipe the slate clean and everything is based on your interview alone. We don't do that. We take everything into account and Amanda already explained all of those weightings to you. We then have to try and calculate how many offers we can make within each fee status category. So if you're a Scottish fee status category, you're only competing with other Scottish fee status category applicants. 
If you come from anywhere else in the rest of the UK, again, you're only competing with people from the rest of the UK. And if you're European or overseas and you're an overseas fee rate, you're only competing with them. So it's not like the whole cohort are all competing with each other. Medicine's a controlled subject, so that means that the Scottish Government tells us how many places we have for each fee status group to come and study with us. I mean, it's no secret to anyone that medicine is hugely competitive. Um, that's a fact. And there are not enough places for the amount of wonderful applicants that we get through our doors. But what I would say to you is, no matter where you study, try and not get fixated on what medical school you want to go to. You may have favourites, you may have places that you think I really want to go there, and that's good, that's fine. But wherever you manage to get a place, you're going to be a doctor at the end, and that's the most important thing. So be sure to contact all of the institutions that you're interested in and try and figure out where you're going to have the best chance, where your profile fits best is probably the best advice that I could give you. So if you do get an offer, what happens now? So you, if you're accepting us as your firm choice at the University of Edinburgh, if you apply to us and you choose to come to study with us, you get lots of guidance after that on what you need to do next. So every medical student that studies in Scotland has to become a member of the Protect and Vulnerable Groups scheme. So we get all of that in place before you actually start on programme. You might be asked to upload verified copies of documents. As Amanda said earlier, the best advice we can give you is check, check, check your emails all the way through the process. Check your emails. You'll be given a sign-in for the University of Edinburgh portal if you apply to us. Check that portal regularly. It is not the first time that somebody has been rejected from the process because we've asked them for vital information. They haven't met the deadline. We've given them a second chance. We've emailed back that up with an e email saying we really need this information and we need it by this date, and we don't hear from them. So we can't keep going back to applicants again and again and again. We get about 3,000 applications a year up until now we have. So you can imagine for us, we're a small team. We can't keep chasing people. So the best advice is just keep checking those emails. And if we ask you for something and you're not sure what it is that we're asking, just, just come back to us and say, I've seen your message, but what is it you need? I don't really understand. Just come back and ask. Um, once you've met the conditions of your offer, you can apply for accommodation. The medical teaching organisation then take over everything. So they look after you the whole time that you're um, undertaking your studies at Edinburgh. Um, you get rid of the annoying admissions team that keep annoy asking you for lots of documents and things. Um, we've just included some useful websites there. And just any questions, obviously we're not taking them just now, but just pop them into Slido and we'll be happy to answer them at the end. So I hope you found that useful. We've just thrown everything at you now, but um, any questions, just get back to us. Thanks so much for listening. Thanks very much, Debbie and Amanda. That was great. Um, I'm sure your heads are spinning, but we'll move swiftly on to Dr. Akwa Hasif, who has come up from London. She's an academic foundation doctor in London. She has just finished her medical school training in Leicester, so it's a slightly different um, scenario. She's going to talk, talk you through that process. Hello. Can you hear me? Awesome. Um, so I'll be talking to you guys about um, my journey as a medical student and I guess my transformative um, processes of what's actually happened to me. Because five years is a really, really, really long time. And I'll tell you a little, I'll give you a little snapshot of what's happened to me um, from 2017 to 2022. So I'm Dr. Aqua. I'm an academic foundation doctor, and what that means is that I'm a junior doctor, and I do some research on the side. And most of my research is in both urology and clinical education. I'll talk more about that later on. So, as I said, I was part of the five-year program in Leicester, and that can be divided into two. 
the preclinical phase, which was um, years one and two, and then the clinical phase, years one, sorry, years three, four, and five. And I'll be talking uh, to you guys about them um, separately. So for the preclinical phase, this was more lecture-based. I was sat in the lecture hall for most of my time, um, and this was purely university-based. What I learned, I learned about physiology and anatomy, which you guys will be familiar with during your A-levels. Learned about the pathology, what, what can go wrong. Pharmacology, because we need to prescribe medications to our patients, so we need to know everything about the, the drugs that we prescribe to them. And throughout um, years one and two, Leicester Medical School at least, we um, were taught some communication skills and we um, got to go to the hospital um, ever, like, you know, every two, three weeks or something, just a couple of sessions, just so we could get exposure to patients. But essentially, uh, they threw the entire human body at us that we had to learn for only in two years. And that was, you know, as you can imagine, quite stressful. So, of course, we had extra help throughout because it is very stressful. And it was amazing because um, we had help from the senior medical students. So the year twos, threes, fours, and fives would come in to um, you know, lecture us and give us their um, hand-me-down notes. And it felt really, really supportive. Because um, one of my colleagues mentioned the GMC um, guidance. As part of that, we are expected to continuously teach each other. And I guess from medical school, from the get-go, you, you do teach the junior medical students. And yeah, as I said, and I alluded to, it was very stressful. And I spent a lot of my time doing these. And a lot of you should recognize the logos on screen now. And if you haven't, I'm disappointed um, on my behalf. Um, but yeah, so if I wasn't studying, I was spending my time on these. Um, parents, I'm sorry, but that, that, that's literally what I did to prevent, uh, you know, burning out. And now, I'd like to talk to you guys about um, my clinical phase. And that was for three years. And there are three main points I'd like, you, like to talk about. So clinical obviously meant going on to placement. And I mostly spent my time in both hospitals and in GP practices. And that was both in the main city, um, so Leicester, Peterborough, all of the big cities, but also in the rural areas where some of the, um, I guess there are less um, populated areas that need care. Um, and most of my time was doing GP or medicine or surgery. Another thing that really stuck out to me were the exams. Obviously, you guys are very familiar with them. And this is the only slide that I put an, um, you know, a, a, an emoji because this has pretty much summed me up. Um, my exams were split into two in Rittens and OSCEs. And Rittens are very similar to your already, you know, if you've done your GCSEs, they're very similar to your A-level exams. Um, we have multiple choice questions and we have like small essay based questions. Um, but with OSCEs in particular, um, obviously this is where you really learn and they assess you to see if you're you know, capable of being a doctor. Um, so they made us diagnose, they made us manage patients, and they made us um, do like simulations um, that we would experience in the hospital as a real junior doctor. But third, and this is something that I really wanted to focus on, we need to think about the future and how you will align with it. And as I said, in five years, you will grow both professionally and personally. And I'll take you guys through my little journey because I think I've really, really made something for myself where I transformed my interests from Fortnite to urology and clinical education. So there's an amazing word, ikigai, which is Japanese for sense of being. And I think when you're at medical school, you will really unlock that for yourself. So I have identified that I love being a doctor. And I'm getting paid to, to be a doctor, which is great. And maybe not yet, because I'm a junior doctor. I'm, I've literally only been a doctor for like six weeks now. But hopefully I will be getting better at it. 
and you know the world needs needs doctors but when you combine all four of them you can really achieve your sense of being which is what ikigai means and if you're if you love something and you're good at it it's just a passion if you're not being paid for it if you know that's what the world needs and it's what you love it's a mission if you're being paid for it and you love it but you're not really loving it it's a profession and it's a vocation if you're if that's what the world needs and if you're paid for it but when you have all of them that is where you can achieve a real sense of accomplishment and it was in year 3 where i had my urology placement and if you don't know urology involves the human plumbing or the waterworks so bladder kidneys etc and one of the consultant urologists told me that aqua would be a fantastic name for an aspiring urologist and that stuck with me and lo and behold i want to be a urologist and yeah i've i've really found my sense of my the reason why i feel like i'm meant to be here and um, so on the left, you can see me with an amazing, he is one of the world's first uh, robotic urologists with the robot. And then on the right, I'm with some of the amazing urologists and I felt really part of the team. And in the center is my lovely partner. And as I said, in your five years of being a med, med student, you will grow personally. And I can definitely say that I think I found the person I want to be with for the rest of my life. Because, again, five years is a long time. And just as a little shameless, shameless plug, that's him. Um, he's big on social media, and he's also got uh, a session, a little series on interviews, which may help. And if you haven't watched him, I'd recommend, because your applications are, or interviews will be coming up. But, yeah. With getting rid of that shameless plug, uh, I am, as I said, Dr. Aqua. And I think I really, really have found what I want to do. Um, so clinically, I have identified that I want to do urology. But on the side, I also am keen on doing research and leadership. And throughout my medical school um, journey, all five years, I acted as course representative, which is a leadership role. And a lot of you will have had done your, you know, your prefect, et cetera, role. And you can still carry that on at med school. And, oh, oh wait, before I go on to that, one of the coolest things that you have to look forward to after your five years is um, you have to swear and make a really, really cool oath. Um, it's, the hip, it's basically like a little modification of the Hippocratic Oath. And um, you have that at the end of five years at your graduation ceremony. And at least for my medical school, we have, we elect someone. And for some reason, they picked me to do it for my cohort, and this is cheesy. I will give to my teachers, colleagues, and students the respect and gratitude that is their due. I will share my medical knowledge for the benefit of the patient and the advancement of healthcare. But yeah, no, you got the gist. I hate hearing my, myself, but that is an amazing opportunity as well. Um, I'd like to briefly talk about intercalation and that essentially means that where the stars are, you can effectively take a year out of your medical school. You, can, you, know, you, you may want it to just have a break, but during this, you can really explore your other interests that you didn't get to really look at because you're at medical school. A lot of my mates did medical research or medical education, surgical skills, but I know some of my friends who also did computer science for a year or even did a master's in graphic design but it really contributes to who you want to be. And remember, this is the time for you to shape yourself. But now, I've talked to you guys about the preclinical and the clinical, and now I really want to briefly talk about what happens after medical school. At least for the time being, you're entered onto the foundation program. And what that entails is two years of being a junior doctor or a foundation doctor, and in F1, you have three rotations, each consisting of four months. Then, similarly, in F2, you have, again, another three rotations for four months each, which will compose of your two years. I have entered into the academic foundation program, which means that 
instead of one of the clinical rotations, instead, I am now doing research because I have identified that not only do I want to cut out prostates and kidneys, I also want to do research. But I wanted to basically point out that there are so, so, so many options for you. You will be a doctor, but you can do so much more as well. You might be interested in medicine, you might be interested in surgery. What about GP um, emergency or anything else acute? What about the different specialties like ophthalmology or dermatology? You get to explore all of that and you get to know what you want to do and what makes you tick. And it doesn't stop there. You can get involved in education, leadership, research, management. You can even get involved in innovation or tech. But essentially, the limit, it's endless. You can do whatever you want to do. But that was a little, little stop tour of my journey as um, a junior doctor and you know, what I did at medical school. But yeah, thank you. Thanks so much, Chakwa. That was fantastic. Um, I think that's probably cheered everyone up after listening to the scary admissions process. So this is um, hopefully a good thing. And I'm going to hand over to Dr. Catherine Abinjo. She is a consultant cardiologist and she is um, an advisor for the National Clinical... Uh, I'll, I'll let you... Let you Uh, good evening, afternoon, evening maybe. Good afternoon, everyone. Thanks very much for coming today and for expressing your interest. Thanks to my uh, fellow speakers, uh, an amazing uh, tour de force of how to get in and then what happens when you do get in. Um, Aqua, I think you've made me want to be a researching urologist now. I wonder if it's too late for me to, to change. So my name's Catherine Labinjo. Um, I'm a heart doctor. Um, I'm also a member of the council here at the Royal College of Physicians, which means that I act as a charity trustee for the board of directors for this college. And I'm also a clinical advisor to the Scottish Government on a policy area program called Realistic Medicine. And I mention those things to you right from the start, just so that, so that you understand the breadth of what medicine can offer you. So yes, as Aqua says, you'll be doctors should you decide to apply to medicine and you're successful. But there is a very wide range of things that you can do once you um, acquire a medical degree and I can talk about that uh, a little bit later and if there are any questions in more detail. But the interesting thing about medicine is that there is a space for everyone within it. So if you're interested in tech and digital or you're creative or you're interested in travel or sports, medicine, or so many things. So you will be able to find a space for you in medicine. And, and also that you will be able to fit in medicine, um, even if you sometimes find yourself in spaces at the moment where you think you're not quite sure whether you do fit. There are so many people at medical school and practicing as doctors, you'll be in a community that's very varied and diverse, and you'll find your fit. Um, I made a promise to myself a while ago, I'm completely blinded by that light by the way, <laughs> I made a promise to myself a while ago that I wouldn't talk about medicine without talking about patients, because that's what it's all about, people and relationships. So just as I was sitting there, I was thinking what story could I tell you that would be really inspirational or infer informative or what would be the right thing and I, I'm, I'm really not sure. but. Um, one story that came to mind was of a patient of mine called Jim. He had a condition called heart failure. And that made him feel unwell and tired and breathless and gave him swollen ankles. And it's a chronic condition, so it's not always easy to cure it, but we manage it. I saw him on a very routine day um, uh, in the clinic. And in fact, there was an issue with clinic space. So the truth is I actually saw him in a cupboard, but we probably shouldn't say too much about that and he was with his wife and we laughed about all being in a cupboard together. Uh, and I gave him a very simple treatment, a, a water tablet, it's called furosemide, and it makes you pee and it made his ankle swelling and his fluid retention better and he felt much better. It was a pretty straightforward um, encounter for me. Um, but for him, it really made him feel so much better. <laughs> So I was very popular with him and his family at, at, at that point. And I, I did a little bit of work, just my day job, 
around how to, um, to think about why he developed this condition and we did some tests and investigations and in fact we discovered he had a condition called amyloidosis which makes the heart thick and stiff and function less well. Um, uh, and that's kind of clever medicine and some very, very clever people work on amyloidosis, not, not, not me, but that actually didn't make much difference to Jim. He was just really delighted that I'd given him a really cheap tablet that made his ankles better. <laughs> Um, and I saw him from time to time to assess his progress and he was always effusive and <laughs> very, very grateful and delighted and uh, made me feel amazing for this very simple piece of work. And so I got to know him and his wife quite well. Um, I met all his children. Um, he had some bumps in the road uh, in his journey as you do with a chronic healthcare condition and we helped him as a team really through all of that. And um, he invited me to his... 60th wedding anniversary, uh, actually after he'd been in hospital and we'd, uh, we'd made an agreement about what were his goals when he was in hospital um, and his goal wasn't really to live any longer but uh, as long as he lived long enough for his 60th wedding anniversary party, not least because they'd paid the deposit and he really wanted to make the most of it. Um, so I said I'd pop in, it was a little distance from the hospital and um, and as uh, you'll learn if you become doctors, you'll frequently break promises and be late, um, always for a good reason. So our colleague who should be with us today um, is performing, I know, a very complex. She, not, she, had, she didn't miss this event for a straightforward transplant. She missed it because of a complex transplant and they needed two surgeons and additional support. Um, so I was a bit late for the... Um, the diamond wedding anniversary, but I was pretty chuffed to go. Neither of my grandparents made it um, to their 60th wedding anniversary, so they didn't live long enough. So it was great to go, and I was a bit late, but I thought they wouldn't mind our pop-in. So I arrived, it was a beautiful function hall in a, a small hotel, and um, Jim was sitting next to his wife with some other people, but there was a space next to him at the top table. And the space next to him at the top table, I might cry actually, <laughs> the space next to him at the top table was for me. Um, and he gave a lovely speech about his wife, but he also gave a lovely speech about me. And I, literally all I'd done is give him the cheapest tablet I have on a very straightforward day at work. Um, he also raised some money for an amyloidosis charity, which was, um, which was terrific. Anyway, I tell you that story because that was one of the best days of my life. Honestly, I felt um, so touched to have been included in um, what is often the, the hardest, most difficult day for the people that you'll be looking after. So we see people as our routine on the worst day of their lives often. Anyway, um, if, I'm not sure if that's inspiring or not. <laughs> Um, so, um, if that resonates for you, that's a really good reason to become a doctor because um, you'll, you will all have experiences like that. I know my colleagues around me all have experiences like that. Um, but there will be other uh, ways which you can make a contribution to. So, I wanted to say before I say anything else, also, if you decide not to become a doctor, that's also okay. So even if you're clever, even if you're good at chemistry, even if you've got good communication skills, you can also do other things. And you can also make a real contribution to society doing other things. But medicine's a great way of doing that, so if it's, if it's right for you, please do. Um, and I also wanted to tell you just a little bit about my, myself. I'm not sure if I'm really the right role model for being inspiring and be a doctor or not. But if we move on to the next slide, I'll tell you a little bit about my journey. So this might project very small, actually, and I don't, I'm not sure I can read it from here either, so I'll just have to bark on it here. So um, I um, really, uh, well, I'll start by telling you a bit about my background. So um, my dad is called Edward. He trained as a motor mechanic, and he ran his own business fixing cars and selling cars, and he still does that, and he's 80. And um, my mom was a, a typist, secretary, she did a little bit of her own business work for a while, but she finished her career as a medical secretary. She died when she was in her 60s. She had a stroke. Um, I've got two siblings, two, uh, three siblings, two sisters. I always call them the ugly sisters. I hope they don't see this recording. They're both beautiful, of course. And, uh, and a brother. I've got two children. Neither of them are in medicine. Neither of my parents went to university. 
Um, I'm from a mixed race family. My granddad is from um, Nigeria and my granny's from Shetland. And that's a really great story if you've ever got time and you want to hear about that. Um, I really loved primary school and I didn't really fit in with secondary school that well and that's another story. So I left school when I was 16 and I went to further education college. And I wasn't really sure that I would ever be um, good enough to be a doctor. Um, and you do need a bit of self-belief to get through all that stuff that you just saw earlier. Um, so I did a degree in, uh, a science degree in biochemistry in, in Aberdeen, which I got into on clearing. And, um, and then I decided that I really wanted to pursue my interest in medicine, which had been there for quite a long time, but I was maybe quite quiet about it. Um, so I, I graduated in uh, 88. I know some of you can't believe that it's possible to still be alive and if I'd graduated in 88. Uh, and um, and uh, before I graduated, I decided I wanted to do medicine, so I did medicine with graduate entry. Um, and I graduated from Edinburgh University in 1993. Um, and I'm, I'm gonna... Um, just give myself a little pat on the back after that journey by saying I graduated well into the top of my class and with honours. So I'm, I'm proud of that. I'm going to take a bow. <laughs> um, I did house jobs in Edinburgh. Then they were called house jobs. Now they're called foundation uh, year jobs. Um, and I, with each stage in this uh, journey, just loved what I was doing more and more and more. So the pre-clinical years of medical school were okay pretty interesting actually. As you described, you get to learn everything about the most fascinating thing you know, which is yourself. And um, the clinical years were just brilliant. That permission and that time to spend um, with, with patients, really, really interesting. I loved my house jobs, although they were very hard work, but we worked in a great uh, team, uh, really supported each other, worked alongside other kinds of healthcare professionals, and I think that's the other thing you should remember, that you can't do anything on your own. Doctors are completely rubbish on their own, just so that you know. So we need um, a huge barrage of people um, around us, nursing staff, um, clerical staff, admin staff, support staff, all those people that make a healthcare system work allow you to flourish as a doctor. So if you don't enjoy that kind of multidisciplinary working, you really won't enjoy being a doctor because you'll be uh, isolated and lonely and not able to be effective. Um, uh, Towards the end of my house jobs, I sat an exam, uh, which was the membership exam. So you're, you're interested in applying to medicine, but we, having become doctors, then treat medicine as a subspecialty of the, the, of the whole thing. So as Aqua said, you can study medicine or surgery or other disciplines, general practice, obstetrics, etc., etc. So I chose to study medicine. Uh, and I did an exam to allow me to become a member of the Royal College of Physicians. And physicians, uh, that's the name we give to doctors who practice medicine. And um, that person sitting right there, that's where I took that exam, in the, that desk right there. I'll never forget it. <laughs> it was really tough. I passed, but it was really tough. Um, but I sat in this room, and I looked around this room. It has an amazing history, of course. But I didn't see anybody in this room really who looked like me. So there's nobody on the walls who looks like me. For a start, they are all men. Well done, ladies. It looks like we're bucking the trend today. Um, and I just want to use that as a reminder for me to make sure that you know that we need a really diverse range of people in medicine. We can't have a group of samey people who think the same and hope to look after the people that we live with in our communities. So I can't encourage you enough not to be put off by anything you think about yourself that means that you think you won't be able to, to be a doctor. Just forget all of that. There really is, the future is bright for people of all backgrounds, colors, genders, um, sexual orientation, religious affiliation, whatever. We really is an inclusive family. Um, so uh, that's also a prompt to remind you, as Aqua said, that you, if you become a doctor, you will be both a student and a teacher for the rest of your lives. 
and we sit a lot of exams in medicine. So whilst there is that wonderful part of the communication with patients, there's also quite a rigorous part, an academic disciplined part, which continues well into your careers um, for, for quite a long time. Um, and, and I continue to do research and studying and exams. Uh, I mean, I, I, you know, well into my 40s, so. Uh, I went, uh, I, uh, I did a medical, what's called a medical rotation, and that allowed me to study all kinds of different disciplines, and that's maybe where I got first really excited about being a heart doctor, doing cardiology. Um, but then I took a little break, and I went to Africa after I'd passed my physician exams and worked there, and that was terrific. Um, everybody told me not to go, so obviously I went. Um, but what I would also say is that, um, you know, sometimes you should do the thing that uh, just feels right for you. And medicine actually does allow you a lot of flexibility to do these things, even if it's not the tick box way of doing stuff. So if you speak to um, uh, doctors, you will find many people have had a wiggly path to get to where they've got. And the, the people with the wiggly path are really interesting. <laughs> so even if you don't get in this time round and you're interested and you do something else and you're still interested and you think about graduate or you think about a different way of contributing within healthcare, that, that, that's, all, um, that's all fine. So I did some research, a formal research degree between 97 and 99 that was sponsored by the British Heart Foundation, so I was paid by the British Heart Foundation to do that. And that led to another degree. At this point, I'm just collecting degrees like they're going out of fashion. Uh, and then I became a, a formal uh, registrar. I, I embarked on a formal training program in, in cardiology. And you'll see by the dates there, sorry, the formatting has gone a bit peculiar. Um, but um, I, I was a registrar, a trainee, um, in my 30s by now, a trainee in cardiology for eight years. So I became a consultant, I've forgotten the dates now, I think when I was 40. So I stopped being a junior doctor aged 40. Um, you guys might be a bit quicker than me. <laughs> uh, I did have two children along the way, and um, that was definitely a plus, although also hard. So, um, uh, and I did some of my training on a less than full-time basis. Again, a slightly uh, less typical course. So please don't be put off um, anyone in the room of either gender who, to whom it's suggested that there are things within medicine that you won't be able to do or aren't compatible with family life or other things outside your life. That's just rubbish. It's a bit more tricky, but it's just rubbish. So you can have a full and complete life should you choose to do other things and still really enjoy medicine. Um, I became a fellow of this college. That just means that you haven't got into trouble, really. Uh, and, um, and, and your colleagues think it's okay to give you the nod, but it, it's a lovely thing to become because you become part of a community. And again, I can't emphasize that, uh, that, that we live in a kind of a family of, of medicine and healthcare practice. So, um, so that was great. Um, I also submitted my doctoral thesis at that point. It took me, um, you're supposed to do it about a year after you finish your research. I think it took me 11 years, but you know, I had a job and kids and stuff, so. Um, and uh, oh, there's a picture of me graduating. That's, that when someone asked me, how do you choose which medical school? Obviously the way you choose is by what color of hood you get when you graduate and how good you're gonna look in the picture. That's what I would say is the most important thing. So that, does Edinburgh still look like that? Is it still that color? And when you graduate from your doctorate after doing your research in Edinburgh, it's a full-length scarlet gown. Just saying, it's terrific. I should have put that picture up. Um, uh, so along the way, I've done lots of other things. Um, uh, you know, uh, I've studied, I've done some leadership training. People always say in a rather trite way that, you know, doctors are all leaders. Um, but to some extent that is true because of your responsibilities, your position, your, um, uh, your, your role in teaching and heading teams. So, uh, but there are all kinds of leaders. So if you don't necessarily now see yourself as a, a leader, particularly if you don't see yourself as one of those people who's super confident or who 
loves giving presentations and makes this sort of stuff look easy. Don't worry about it, because that all comes with time. Uh, so I did some leadership work. I did some work on improving uh, patient safety and care and uh, more studying around that. And, and now, as I said, I'm an advisor to the Scottish Government, which means for the first time I've reduced my clinical activity for the first time since I started. And that was really hard to give things up, give up those patients, but really, really interesting. And at all points al along your career in medicine, that's one of the things that's fantastic about it as a career, there continue to be opportunities to learn and do things differently. And that suits me really well, not because I get bored, maybe a tiny little bit easily bored, but um, just because constantly developing and, and finding out new things is, is great. Next slide, please. So, um, I was asked, I think, a little bit to say why I became a doctor. You know, I'm not completely sure, but these are a few things that um, came to mind when I was thinking about it. So, the first thing you see there is a book. It's called The British Pharmaceutical Codex. I meant to bring it with me. Um, so, although my dad didn't go to university, his brother did. He became a pharmacist. And this book was lying around in my house from when I was quite young and uh, I really liked flicking through it and although um, part of being medicine is supposed to want to cure people and, and, and help them live a long time, one of the things that the British Pharmaceutical Codex at that point had in it was a lot of stuff about things you could kill people with which I found really fascinating. <laughs> So, at the same time, I was maybe reading some Agatha Christie books, and, you know, there was, they were always full of um, cyanide and strict, strict uh, whatever, yeah, all these uh, different poisons, strychnine. Um, but they're also in that, that book. Pharmacists used to dispense them. So, I was always curious about things that made people better, but also things that made people worse, and a bit about how things worked and the, the chemistry of things, and this book actually gives you the chemical formulas of all these, these different um, drugs. It's absolutely fascinating what it was for me. Um, I liked solving puzzles, um, so like Rubik's Cube. I guess that's the, um, you know, the 1980s or 70s version of your <laughs> video games. That's how exciting life was when I was young. Yeah, I was okay at the Rubik's Cube. I could do it. Um, I, I was really curious about anatomy and taking things apart and putting them together. Oh, and I had a chemistry set. So those kinds of things, maybe some of this resonates with you and some of it makes you think, what on earth I was she allowed to practice? Um, and we also had in our house occasionally from my uh, granny, she got this magazine called The Reader's Digest and it had a series in it. And I kid you not, this particularly influential for me, a series called... Um, I Am Joe's. My favourite actually wasn't I Am Joe's Heart, but I Am Joe's Heart is here. My favourite was I Am Joe's Adrenal Gland, and it was the story of being the adrenal gland of Joe. <laughs> so I find that completely fascinating. But I didn't really know that that meant that I could be or might want to be a doctor. That all came really slowly and later, partly because you need the support of people around you to make you think that something like that's possible. And the nice thing for the people who are here is that I can see that you not only have the curiosity and the interest, but it looks as though you're in a supported kind of environment. So that's a great start. Um, and bingo, well, that relates to Mrs. McCleary, who was blind. And I used to um, visit her once a fortnight with my mum. And we did a thing called a beetle drive, which is some bizarre puzzle where you put bits of a beetle together. And also I did her bingo because she was blind. Um, but the thing that was really interesting about her was that she always knew, even though she was completely blind, <laughs> she always knew whether I was paying attention or not and marking off the numbers because she had that incredible sense that um, people get when they're deprived of one sense. Um, she also knew when I was putting extra sugar in my tea. She knew, and I found that aspect of her just really, really fascinating. So if you're curious, I think that's kind of what I'm saying, uh, and you're interested in how things work, and you like a bit of puzzles, and you like reading, whether it's Agatha Christie about how to kill people, or about Joe's adrenal gland, then you should be doctors. Okay, I don't have anything um, 
very much more specific to say, and I don't know where we are on time. Deborah, you asked me to say a little bit about um, what should you consider when applying or which medical school, and I think you guys have covered that already. Um, they are all very different. I think it's quite hard for you to navigate that, and I know it takes a lot of work, um, but I think you just need to find the one that's a fit. Um, a fit for you depending on, the, uh, on what they need. They all produce the same medical degree and I've worked with hundreds of doctors in my career and I don't know where any of them went to medical school and I don't care. Nobody cares. So find a place you want to go and a course that you enjoy, something that's got the inter intercalated bit that you like um, or has the way of studying that you like or has the qualifications or, you know, um, the, uh, admissions criteria that you like uh, and do that. And even the great lauded institutions in our uh, country, like the Oxbridge uh, universities, I, I do have some colleagues who went to Oxford and Cambridge, I, um, but I never find out for, for years. They don't seem any different to me or any different uh, or, or any more or less able. So go to the place that suits you. Don't worry about that. Um, also, you asked me, Deborah, why study medicine, and I just have said here that it's really fascinating, um, and that's why I would do it, and, and you need to enjoy that lifelong student and teacher a bit, and it is really challenging, and it's intellectually quite challenging, but just to let you know, it's no more intellectually challenging than any other science degree. You don't need to be super, super clever um, to be a, a doctor or a real science boffin, it's just that the admissions criteria make that one of the things. So, you know, an absolute passion for science and it uh, doesn't need to be the strongest thing. Um, and um, I think you also said what happens after graduation. But I think between that, we've covered that and we can take anything else um, in questions. So I, I, I hope that's at least been a, an insight about maybe either what to do or what definitely not to do in your lives. You'll, you'll decide it one way or the other. So thanks very much. Okay, so that was another really inspirational talk and just shows you how varied we can be as doctors. These are just two of the stories that you've heard today. Um, Aqua is still very early in her journey and, and Dr. Davinci was a bit more, a bit further on. Every single doctor you will meet will have a different story. Um, and it's just a case of asking the question and seeing what the response comes out as and every one of you will have a different journey. It doesn't matter what it looks like. Um, so this is the question and answer part of the session. So I'm going to ask, we've got a few good questions on Slido, but also I want to ask if there's anyone in the room who wants to stand up and ask a question as well. Is there anyone feeling brave? If not, we'll go to Slido and we'll take a few questions and we'll discuss them as a panel. We do have someone who's got a, a microphone in the back, if you can see. So if you'll just raise your hand if, you're, if, you, if you'd like to, to, to ask your question aloud, someone is ready for you. Or we just have all the, the questions yeah, on Slido. Yeah, that's fine. I'm, I'm happy to read them out and kind of talk through, through the ones we have on Slido as well, if that's interesting. Yeah, Anyone? Just to say there are no stupid questions. Yeah. There's nothing that you can ask us that will think that's why yeah. would you say that. So please feel free. There we go. We've got our first question from the room. Hey, um, I was curious about the interpolation structure whether you do, I mean, you're studying for a year or something else and that gives you, like, a BSc in surgical sciences, say? Yeah. Um, well, Aqua, do you, want to, do you want to take that or I'll take that? If not, go ahead. Go ahead, Aqua. Um, I should, yeah, okay. Um, so with integration, yeah, uh, BSc and surgical skills, I know Imperial, for example, they do um, an integration where you get awarded a bachelor's but, and you get the formal ceremony and everything, and then after you go back, so for example, if you do it in, in between second and third year, you go straight into your third year after you've completed it, like normal, but you have to register way beforehand, and you have to let your medical school know that that's what you plan to do, um, and then they integrate you fully back in, that there is no difference. Um, and not only can you do a bachelor's, you can also do a master's, and I know some crazy, crazy people who also integrate PhDs and MPhils, Mad people, but it, it is, it can be done. Uh, 
it's important to say that every university structure is slightly different. Um, some medical schools will include intercalating as part of your degree. So Edinburgh currently do a six-year course, and you you are, you have to do a, a, um, an intercalated degree as part of that. There will be other, um, as you say, you can do them at different points throughout your medical career, and you can do masters or bachelors or PhDs in amongst everything. So there's, there are lots of different options, and if that's something that's really important to you, it might be worthwhile having a look at what each university you're applying to has in mind for that. Okay, anyone else in the room? If not, we'll... Let me go to Slido. Um, so, we've got one for the um, our admissions team. So, a lot of people are asking kind of what proportion from... This is only from Edinburgh, so we can only really talk about the Edinburgh um, system, but what proportion of students come in from Scotland, what come from the UK, what come from elsewhere? So for 2022 entry, so the students that have just started on programme, um, we had 170 places for Scottish fee rate students. We had 56 for those coming from the rest of the UK and uh, 25 for those coming who had an international overseas fee rate. Um, so by and large, if you're Scottish fee rate, there are far more places available for you um, than if you're from any of the other fall under any of the other fee rates. So I hope that's helpful. We don't actually get the numbers each year until, so for 2020 fee entry, it'll probably be January time that we get final confirmed numbers. Um, so we kind of just tend to work on the figures from the year before and we get an indication if we're going to get a bit more places. So for 2020 fee, we expect that number to go up a bit. So I hope that's helpful. Okay. Anyone else within the room who's got a question? If not, I'll move on to the next one that we've got. So um, I'm going to talk about this slightly more generally, but the, um, the specific question is, are UK medical degrees recognised in the US? But I think we'll, we'll, I'll probably kind of broaden that to talk about um, are they recognised overseas in general? US has uh, every different place that you might work um, has specific entry requirements and that um, they will vary. Dr. Lubinjo, do you want to take that one? Have you, you've obviously worked overseas, just... Um, yeah, so I'm, I'm not very up to date, but the truth is that um, I, the UK medical degree will be recognised all over the world, but the regulation about how you are uh, permitted to work is variable and changeable. Mm -hmm. So yes, you can work in the UK, uh, in the USA, but they will ask you to complete their US boards exams, as far as I know, and actually they vary state by state, and they're not even national. So your medical degree still holds, but they will have some further evaluation that they want to do. Some uh, countries have uh, you know, a reciprocal arrangement where we recognize degrees and therefore there aren't further tests that are required, but there will be a number of other hurdles. So there's, it's a difference between holding the degree holding the full registration that comes with foundation training and then also um, meeting their regulator requirements. Mm -hmm. So it's quite variable. Um, what I would say is it's always uh, worth considering studying, studying abroad as well as spending mm -hmm. some time abroad. And it's, it's possible, as you know, to study medicine in other countries and in an English language if that's your, um, your best language. Um, and it's also possible, of course, to study medicine in the USA, but I think it is completely a proposal. I don't think there's anywhere you can do medicine in the US as an undergraduate um, degree. That said, you won't be surprised to hear that I'm a big fan of people who come into medicine as graduate entry. It's fine to do it from school also, but um, you don't lose anything by being older, wiser, smarter, and have done other stuff. So don't worry about that. Mm -hmm. I think that's just a very important point. So every, every country will have different entry requirements, but your medical degree will allow you to help people in countries across the world. Um, it just decide, just you choose where you'd like to go and, and work that out individually. Um, another one for the assessment team. What type of questions do you like to ask on assessment days? Well, they probably can't give you the official ones, but something similar to the official ones or what might be on your website. Um, we wouldn't um, disclose what sort of questions that we ask. Um, all we do is give you a link to the Medical Schools Council's list of attributes. So just go on there, read those attributes, think about how do I fit into this, what attributes do I have 
that already meet that? And how did I get those attributes? What sort of experience have I had, medical related experience that have helped me get there? And that's what you'll be asked to talk about, basically. Yeah, that's kind of what I was mentioning earlier about the personal statement. Like, it's not formally assessed, but that's where it comes into play then, is all those experiences that reflect and rationalise those attributes. Um, so again, it's not formally assessed for, uh, like prior to shortlisting, but that's when it becomes important for um, assessment day. But yeah, I, I wish we could tell you, the, you know, the, the ins and outs, but yeah, I hope that's helpful. And is it, it's worth, I don't know what you know about the other universities, but I gather that they're really quite varied. So different parts of the country will be looking for very different things. As you said, some people taking that, those assessments in the round, some people just taking the interview once you, once you make it. It's really, really important to do your research very, very carefully for each of the medical schools that you're thinking of applying to, because they, they really do, when you get into the detail, look for things that are quite different. So some assessments, I don't know what you do in Edinburgh, some assessments include assessments of dexterity, you know, you'll, you'll mount a needle and be stitching, uh, some people are just asked, uh, asked questions, some will include interactions I think with, you know, uh, actors and, and so on, so it's really variable, but they generally have really good information on their website, so do your homework carefully. That's really the first test of getting into medical school whether you can do the homework that's required to find out how to get into medical school. You guys are on the great place because you, you started that journey. Okay, um, the next question which I think is probably quite interesting is um, what pastoral support is there both during medical school, your foundation years and your clinical years? Um, because obviously things can go wrong, things happen in your life, things happen in life in general. Um, and as Aqua said, it can be quite a stressful time. This is the first time you, a lot of you will have been away from your families. It's obviously been an unusual few years in the last um, two or three years, and you're coming to terms with that as well as getting out into a new, entirely new group of people. Um, so I'll, we're going to take this in three sections, I think. Why don't we ask the admin team for what um, the university here does? We'll ask Aqua about her experiences, and then we'll ask Dr. Binjo about what happens later in life. Okay. Yeah, so um, at Edinburgh Medical School, we've got a fantastic student support team. Um, you're supported from the day you arrive to the day you leave. Um, there's a thing called academic families. I don't know if you remember Medra. Um, so it's quite good, like you'll join and you'll have a mum, you'll have a brother, you'll have an auntie. Um, kind of what Aqua was saying, like from day one, the kind of senior year students will be there to support you throughout your journey. You're learning and then eventually you'll be someone's mum, you know, it sounds weird, but. Um, but yeah, that, that's fantastic. Like the, the support from the students is, is stellar and the student support team within the uni is, is great. Um, and you'll have a tutor there as well for you like for each year, like a year coordinator who you can always liaise with um, at certain points in the, the degree. Um, but yeah, it's I think as well in the application process, there's support too. So if you are a flag or flag plus applicant and you've maybe undertaken um, specific uh, courses like REACH or LEAPS if you've been involved in that, um, that you will get support from the WINE and participation team from the point at which before you've even submitted your application they will help you at that point. Um, obviously we as the admissions team will help you, that's why I said it's really important to tell us if you've got caring responsibilities or if you have severe extenuating circumstances that have maybe affected your time at school. Ordinarily, we would expect your school to apply to exam boards for any kind of uh, moderation of grades or anything like that. But we will take those sort of circumstances into account as well, but you have to tell us about them. So you wouldn't want to, again, use up that space in your personal statement to do that. You would maybe want to email us before you submit your application or get your school to provide you with a letter which explains your circumstances if they are aware of your circumstances. It's also important to um, contact the Student Disability Service even before you've applied or at the point of applying just to find out can this institution that I want to apply to, can they support you through your learning? What sort of support can they give you if you've got specific requirements? Um, it's important to be aware of that as well. And before you apply, this is not so much about pastoral support, but if you have a particular um, need, 
um, whether that be uh, mentally or physically, that you check the fitness to practice um, regulations as well for medical students and doctors to make sure that actually you can meet those standards that they're looking for too. I hope that's helpful. Okay, Aqua? Yeah, so um, remember, so I'll talk about what happens at when you're at medical school. Remember that when you're at med school, you are surrounded by like-minded people just like you. So you have your colleagues, you have your mates who you can depend on, and these are the people that you will be for five or six or four years, depends on which uh, route you take. And then, um, as uh, similar to Edinburgh and Leicester, we had medic families where I met my mum, and then I think after year four, she, she graduated in year five, which, which you know, I, it sucks, because I couldn't really talk to her much after that, but it's fine. Um, then I had my medic family, and then we um, obviously, we were, in year one and year two, we were allocated into little study groups, so we always had them to depend on as well. And then throughout, we have the pastoral support unit, who are more formal, um, that they're, you know, formally, they're, that's their role, where you can talk to them and email them about anything and everything. It doesn't matter if there's something wrong at home, if there's something that's happened on placement, they will listen and talk to you about anything and everything, and they are not judgmental at all. They are there to listen to you and listen to your concerns. Um, and then if, for example, something happens at, you know, you're, you're on a placement and you see something worrying, there's always going to be someone on site. For example, if you're doing your cardiology rotation in year three and you see maybe a junior doctor has done something that is not 100% comfortable, you can raise it then and there um, with your senior colleagues and that could be escalated higher up, for example. But there's always, always support at every single stage you're at. And most importantly, you are surrounded by people just like you. Remember that. And look, look at me right now. I'm, I'm a brown Muslim woman. Somehow, I'm, I'm sitting here talking to you guys. So, yeah, you know, yeah. Okay, Josh Rubinger. I like Aqua had the problem occurred in the cardiology ward. That's all I'm saying. <laughs> so was the cardiologist. Sorry. I'm sure. <laughs> um, it, <clears throat> in medicine, we have a thing um, as part of our uh, regulation, which is called a duty of candor. Um, and that means that you have to tell it as it is. So, um, Pastoral care, I believe, in UK universities could be better. And, and, and I think you don't need to read very far or very wide to understand that. Uh, and I'm telling you that as a parent, not as a cardiologist. So that could be better, and that's a worry. And we need to be on top of that. And you need to think about that in the institutions you choose, and you should test that. Um, by looking at the student surveys and by asking hard questions to places that you go. Um, all universities look great for people who are having a great time, but the university you need to pick is, a, is the one that's going to look after you when you're not having a great time, and it's unpredictable, and some of us just don't have a great time sometimes for reasons you just never know what's going to happen. So I, I, I would say do that carefully. There are very many amazing people trying to improve the systems, I think, across the UK university, and they need to have a, a lot of credit for that. But it would be a lie to say that it's perfect. Uh, and there are things, um, even within academic families, um, particularly within sports teams, which you'll have heard around, around pressure to participate and be like other people and, for example, uh, do things like rituals and alcohol consumption and hazing. Many of you will have perhaps experienced that at school already. I think it's a real problem. It's quite a UK problem, although there's a particular sports thing around it in the US as well. Um, and uh, all I can say is, um, generally, if you speak up, you will find people who, who will help you. Um, so the really important thing is not to feel under pressure, not to speak up. It's just really, really important to share. Um, and then um, you'll, you'll, you'll often find help. And, and the same is true, I think, in training programs and even in um, the consultant workforce now. And you'll read things about burnout. It's quite scary. But the other thing to say is that um, sometimes if you're not feeling great, it's not your fault, it's the system around you and the structures around you, and we need to really work together to get those right as, as well. 
So sometimes when things aren't feeling quite right for you, there isn't actually anything you can do about it. You need to speak up about it, let other people share that burden, take some of the weight. And um, I think it's our responsibility, everyone who's associated with the college, to speak up and be honest about these things and, and do better. We're doing much better than we were, but there is still work to be done. Mm -hmm. Thank you for that. Um, you know, it's really important to say that we, we work in a team. Medicine is a team sport. It is a, you will never be left out on your own and all you need to do is speak to a colleague you're comfortable speaking to and things will happen and a problem shared is a problem halved. So I think that's probably, um, I think we're just about out of time. Debbie, is that right? One more question. Um, okay. Uh, we'll do a quick one on work experience then and how much work experience is ideal. So obviously for you guys, the last few years has been difficult and things that your previous colleagues would have done to try and get into medical school will not have been possible. Um, there are many ways that you can, can show things. So there's a, a second question about could you go and shadow a dentist? Anybody at all in any way medically minded or trained, it doesn't need to be a, um, a, a doctor specifically, it could be shadowing nurses, shadowing pharmacists, shadowing, um, you know, working in a, um, working with young children, it, uh, caring responsibilities in any way. There are hundreds of things that you can do to show that you have empathy, to show that you care for others, um, and to show that you're interested. I think that's probably fair. Any, any other comments from the front? Yep, Dr. Lavinger. Um, so I, I've helped a, a few people with personal statements and done some evaluation and so on and different things over the years and um, I think there's far too much emphasis placed on work experience. You have no idea what it's like doing my job just because you come and see me do my job for a morning. So, you know. Um, what is really tells people apart is le it, it's definitely not quantity of work experience. Mm. Um, but it is about the quality of work experience and it's also absolutely, for me, about your reflections and observations about what you've done. Mm -hmm. So I don't care what you do, really. I, I, I would be pretty happy with non-medical work experience, mm -hmm. to be honest. If you can tell me something about working with people, with relationships, with challenges, and you can reflect on that and your own role in that and, and what your contribution to that is, because that's what the practice of medicine is. And that's a very transferable skill. So it exists in many workplaces. So I think having some insight into the field is great, but as we've said, it's a very, very diverse field. So you, it, it is a generic uh, approach that you're looking for. It's something it just allows you to reflect on interactions and communication and so on, much more than it is about having met the professor of medicine and hung out with him for a week. Or her, sorry. Mm -hmm. You should have got that right. Yeah. Absolutely. Is that, we, I think we're a few minutes over time, so I'm just going to pass back to Debbie um, just to finish up. But thank you all so much for coming, and hopefully that was useful. The, panel will be around for a little bit afterwards if you've got any questions that haven't been answered we'll try and answer them for you thank you oh sorry we've got we've got one extra um i don't know if any of you are, are um from schools where not very many people apply to or go to do medicine but it's hard for those schools sometimes to know exactly what's required from the admissions process it's not their um routine so if if you are in that position please don't be afraid to do your research about what you need from schools and to ask us how, how, how we can help you with all kinds mm -hmm. of things, including personal statements. Okay. Yeah, I would just add to that that in our experience, uh, no disrespect to any teachers that are here, I'll get lunched afterwards, but please get in touch with admissions teams at each of the universities that you're interested in going to and ask very specific questions. We will be happy to give you very specific answers. And if your school aren't listening, get your parents involved and get your parents to talk to the school and say, we've been in touch with the admissions team. This is what they're telling us because there's so much bad advice out there from our experience. Talk to us, please. Thank you.
one more thing and then you guys get to go home for supper. <laughs> um, I, I did want to thank you so much to our fabulous panel who has done everything that, oh, so delightful. We hope that this has been helpful to you. A big takeaway, and I'm, I'm a teacher, so I took no offense to what you said, absolutely. But as a teacher, I hope you understand that you are never alone in this process. As you apply, even during assessment day, you're not alone. When you go to medical school, you're not alone. When you become a, a, any place in the medical school, you're still not alone. That it will not be a time, even if you are here by yourself, you're still not alone. There is always someone who is here for you. I have, uh, or the college, has, has made the most non-threatening document in the universe. It is a, uh, just a quick guidebook. It, this is just, a one-page thing where you fill this out yourself. Nobody's going to check it out. There's no right or wrong answers here. It's just the UR, sorry, the, the QR code that will get you to the medical school homepage to all medical schools in Scotland. And you can do a side-by-side -side analysis on what is unique about that medical school. How does it fit within what you want to do in medicine? It's going to ask really, really broad, but questions that you probably need to start thinking about right now. And it will help you as you build the applications for the medical schools that you want to go to. Don't be afraid to be bold. If you have a chance to go to a place that you're like, am I really going to be living in Aberdeen right now? I don't know. Probably go for it. The, the adventure is real. And the back of it is answering four or five of the questions that you have, which is like, how do I practice for assessment day? What are the support systems to kind of get me there? There are two that we deeply recommend. Um, the Royal College of Physicians, we work in collusion, collusion, that sounds dangerous, <laughs> connection with You Can Be a Doctor, which is a, a nonprofit organization that is run by doctors. They take you through the interview process, a mock interview. They will do it one on one if that's what you need. They specialize in students from the Highlands and Islands and students that have no resources within their, their grasp. They have a gajillion answers to your questions. So we highly encourage you to, to speak with them and they will get in contact with you. And if there's other teachers out there, we do physician visits that will come to your school and talk all about it. The next one is developing the young workforce. And I feel like students in this audience may be like, oh yes, I know it. I see that banner every time I go to school. Every square inch, sorry, I'm a terrible American, every square centimeter of Scotland is covered by the developing young workforce. You have a representative, no matter where you are in Scotland. Hit this QR code up and find that person and they will help you on this journey no matter where you are. So again, you're never alone. This is available to you as you leave. We're not trying to push you out or anything. Also, University of Edinburgh has given us these very charming uh, syringe pens that you should also take on your way out. But again, thank you so much and best of luck to all of you. Well done.